This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology slash Oncology, where we discuss the latest research, treatment considerations, and other issues related to hematology and oncology. Welcome to this podcast. I'm your host, Dr. David Henry, and today we're going to be talking about sickle cell with a friend and colleague of mine, Ife Osunquo, who is director of the Sickle Cell Disease Enterprise, and she's a professor of medicine there at the Levine Cancer Institute at Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. And welcome to our podcast. Once again, you're, we brought you back in. It's like Saturday Night Live, Ife, where they say, this is my fifth time hosting Saturday Night Live. This is your second time, so we really second appreciate, time appreciate, you, appreciate, yeah. appreciate you coming back. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry. appreciate it. You're so welcome. So to remind our audience, you're an expert, and I've heard you speak many times on sickle cell management. Uh, all of us in general practice, like myself, have our own patients where we have chronic pain problems besides other problems these patients get. And I know you at the ASH uh, recently in December 2020 did an educational session on some of the long-term consequences, which I want to get into in a second with regard to the brain, cognition, mood. But I thought just to set up the stage for our listeners who probably all have their own such patients, maybe briefly your approach to the patients that admitted three, four times a year for a sickle crisis. How are you managing outpatient, inpatient? Maybe a few words about the regimens you like to use or avoid. Very good. Thank you so much. And I really am glad to be back here on this podcast. And, you know, sickle cell disease is a chronic lifelong condition. And our patients will have pain on and off for the entire duration of their life. When I was growing up, the lifespan was about five years. And then it was 14 years. And, and, and then it was 21 years. And at that time, the, really the model for pain was help them get out of any pain because they're going to die young. And so it didn't matter how much opioids we used because the goal was to make them comfortable. Let's palliate these young children to give their life some quality because they're not going to live to be adults. And I think we, we do such a great job with sickle cell disease management overall that today, 99% of children with sickle cell disease will live to become adults. And we still use the model of palliative pain management with acute opioids when they have a crisis and chronic opioids when they have chronic pain. And I don't think it fits the model of their life anymore because most of my patients are now in their 50s, 60s. I saw a 71-year-old yesterday. Um, and so if you're giving somebody treatment for pain, you have to take into account what is their disease trajectory. Mm -hmm. And for every therapeutic intervention, what are the pros and cons for giving it once, giving it twice, or giving repeatedly over decades of life? So when a child comes in with pain for the first, second, third um, pain crisis, we definitely, you know, hit them with fluid hydration, IV opioids, and then move to, you know, oral opioids at discharge, and some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. And it works really well to manage their pain in children. As they move into adolescence and they've had repeated exposure to pain and to opioids, the, the, the clinical picture changes. And we don't know when exactly this happens, but anywhere from puberty to like the early teens, late teens and early 20s, they now go to where when they have a pain crisis, it, the pain doesn't go away in three or four days. It lasts for five, six, mm -hmm. seven days. Mm -hmm. And now they're on opioids for a week or two weeks in the hospital. And while it may help their pain, they now run into that cycle of exposure to high dose opioids actually exacerbates their pain. Um, I don't um, have a lot of followers in this model of taking care of people with sickle cell disease and, you know, acute or chronic pain. I think the community has still been stuck in the previous model where palliate them and treat them with opioids to get their pain to disappear. But I usually take a step back and say, if you're cutting in for the sixth time in a year, the seventh or the eighth time, and I've used high-dose hydromorphone or high-dose uh, morphine to treat your acute pain, and you're in the hospital for a week, 10 days, 14 days, and your pain is not getting better, you're miserable, I'm miserable, we need to try something different, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, when you talk to the pain specialty literature and the uh, specialists, they think about things like IV ketamine in addition to opioids to try to do two things, manage the 
hyperalgesia that you get from the opioids, but also treat pain and also the anxiety and the distress that being in pain for a long time creates. And so during my session at ASH, we had Dr. Lawrence Long talk about use of IV ketamine as an adjuvant to opioids in the patient with chronic pain with an acute exacerbation who is going through what we call the opioid vortex of misery, right? More pain begets more opioids, begets more pain, begets yeah. more opioids, begets more pain. And there have been situations where people have responded to that approach. They need less opioids, they get better, and they're able to go home. The other thing you have to do is really think about what is the cause of their pain? Is this all acute vasoclusive pain, or are we missing other comorbidities? And in my session, I talked about they may have pain from sickle cell disease, vasoclusive crisis, or they may have sickle cell chronic pain, uh, you know, evascular necrosis, leg ulcers, you know, bone infarcts, or they may have neuropathic pain. But they may have pain from a non physical cell cause, you know, gallbladder, migraine headaches, dysmenorrhea. And you really have to kind of ask the right questions and go through that strict differential diagnosis to get to where you're treating the right cause of pain. If they have gallstones, giving opioids is not going to help. They treat the gallbladder by taking out the gallstones, they take out the gallbladder, and then their pain will improve. If they have dental damage and decay, treat the source of chronic inflammation and the pain will get better. If they have a bone infarct, it doesn't matter what you do, it's not gonna get better until you give it time. Um, mm -hmm. And if it's neuropathic pain, add a neuropathic medication like an SSRI or a neuroleptic agent, you know, the gabapentinoid, these are things that can be helpful. There was a- uh, So I'm hearing you say that I've fallen into this uh, vortex with the patient, just as you've said, they have a contract, they're coming into the emergency room, you put them on their acute and chronic uh, rescue medications, uh, said done. But I really like your approach. Take a time out. What's the cause? Is it a base occlusive crisis or other? Yep. Okay. And, or it may be or and. Okay. Many times it's base occlusive crisis with something else. And and there's something I found that when I moved to Charlotte um, in 2015, you know, new geographical area, I didn't know the population very well, and I would get these consults from the emergency room, sickle cell, 25 year olds with pain, you know, low grade fever, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps. Um, pain is like my usual sickle cell crisis, you know, and they'll treat the patient like they normally do. They'll come in, spend four or five days, go home, or spend the week and then go home, and then they'll come back again the next week and then come back again the next week. And I was like, why is there a stomach bug that inflicts my young adult patients preferentially all year round, in February, in March, in June, in August, in September, in, de in, de in December? And it struck me that when you look at their, if you take a step back and say, if this is not sickle cell disease, what would I be thinking about? They've received high-dose opioids repeatedly. They went home with either few pills of opioids or no opioids at all. They come back with tachycardia, low-grade fever, and abdominal cramp and GI symptoms. And I was like, if this is opioid withdrawal. Hmm. Yeah. If you look at somebody who's on heroin or cocaine and they go through opioid withdrawal, it's very dramatic, right? I don't see that in my sickle cell patients. But when you look at the constellation of symptoms, they are going through what I think is subacute opioid withdrawal hmm. and mm -hmm. um, they have sweat and then they get better once you give them opioids. And so the key is to look at not just that event of acute pain exacerbation, look at the historical trend. Is this the fifth, sixth, tenth admission or ER visit? And is there a, a long-term treatment plan that they're engaged in to mitigate this potential complication? And many young adults, as you know, um, are not in comprehensive care. They're, you know, they get care when they have an emergency and then they go on their life, you know, with their life and they tend to not think longer term and they tend to fall prey to this chronic cyclic opioid withdrawal syndrome. And then after a while, it becomes a chronic pain syndrome. And so it really is important to kind of take a step back, take a time out and really evaluate. It can be sickle cell pain, but is it only sickle cell pain, acute VOC pain, or is there something else that is at play? So for, if I could then take us to the inpatient setting, which many of us see, and the patient we think we've done the timeout, it's vasoclusive crisis. Can you critique one or more of these approaches, good, bad? So hydromorphone diluted every four hours, every three hours, every two hours, with or without Benadryl, I know what you're gonna say, but better get it out there. Um, and the PCA, demand or basal, 
what, do you, what are the pros and cons? What do you like, not like of what you just heard? So I do not like as needed IV water or IV morphine. And the reason is you already have a patient who is dealing with pain and anxiety and is now dependent on the as needed order to get pain relief. And it doesn't matter if it's acute pain in a young person or acute um, chronic pain in an older person. That dependency on external environment to get pain relief creates even more anxiety and opportunity for stigma and discrimination. So PRN is not recommended by the sickle cell guidelines either with ASH or with NHLBI for 2014. The recommendation is if you're going to treat pain, treat pain and treat it well. So you typically we recommend an IV opioid on a schedule based on the half-life of the drug. So the larger half-life is 90 minutes to 120 minutes. And in sickle cell disease, it may actually be shorter because of the increased GFR and renal clearance, which is why I prefer the PCA, because if you're going to give them IV blood at every two hours, the nurses are not going to like you, because they may end up needing to be given every one and a half hours or every hour. So the PCA allows self-control of giving the medication to the patient, and you don't have to kind of have the nurses running them out of the room all the time. Mm -hmm. I also recommend adjuvants with a non steroidal anti inflammatory agent, either toroidal or toroidal. Um, if they can create the IV toroidal, you can do IV profen or a lead. If they have good kidney function or if they have no other risk factors for either renal damage or bleeding or retinopathy. And you try that, and if you're dealing with the pain is still not responding to what the traditional thing is, you escalate, of course. And when you get to a certain escalation, if the pain is getting worse with your escalation, you're now at that opioid abortive condition. I could step back and say, okay, am I now causing more harm by going up on the opioid? What else can I do? That's where ketamine comes in, IV, or things like um, adding gabapentin or adding um, an SSRI, okay? Sometimes just treating anxiety, right? Give them a little bit of low dose, very gingerly added, but to kind of calm them down is recommended to kind of reduce the anxiety that triggers more pain. I do not give IV Benadryl to my patients. I think that um, after working in physical disease for 27 years, there's very few patients that have the intense curitis from opioids. Now that we're not using Demerol anymore, some people have a bit morphine, but where my clinic, my system, we use hydromorphone, and it's not as curitis invoking as morphine is or as Demerol. Is. And I really haven't seen, other than maybe a handful of patients, the severe itching that causes the scoriation of their skin. And so I can give them PO Benadryl when they actually have itching, mm -hmm. but not as a prophylaxis, just in case you itch later on, because you're compounding two sedating drugs in a patient. I make them, I say, you gotta choose. Am I gonna give you your pain medicine to help your pain, which may make you over sedated, or do I give you Benadryl to treat your may happen itching later on? Giving the two has led to more complications and more side effects. Just we mm -hmm. published an article looking at Benadryl, and we found that patients who had Benadryl IV stayed longer in the hospital and had um, used more opioids because they were there longer. We didn't see the acute chest um, uh, complication more in one, the, the Benadryl group, but we did have a lot of patients in the study. It was a small study. But there are people who report over sedation, right? And then you end up giving Narcan because they are sleeping too much and become hypoxic, get acute chest syndrome. So I'm just a little nervous about compounding, and there's no scientific rationale for doing IV Benadryl. Now, PO Benadryl works really well within 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. And I told my patients, if you really want to get Benadryl and you think IV works better, get the liquid. The liquid will work in about 30 minutes. The pill will work in about 45 minutes. The IV will knock you out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it, yeah. yeah but I'm a believer in the PCA uh, machine. I believe that give them either a, a, a demand dose or a very low dose basal with the demand dose Again, you have to have a system in place to monitor the CO2, make sure they're not getting over data, and don't just put the PCA and leave them. You have to reevaluate, are they responding, are they not responding, are they over-responding, and adjust it accordingly. The biggest mistake people make is they put the PCA in the morning on Monday, and they never readdress until Thursday afternoon. Okay. That is inhumane. So before we go to long-term effects, just a question that ketamine I haven't used. Can you mention a bit about dosing, interval, how do you use it? Ooh, now I'm going to plead the Fifth Amendment on that one because I call my pain folks. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that hematologists order ketamine unless you already have a vetted protocol that is approved by both the pain people and anesthesia in your health. Oh. 
So get everybody involved. Yeah, you, get, yeah. Yeah. you want to make sure that you're not giving too much response to CNS publicity or too little where you're not going to get effect. And okay. you can give it either as a PRN, low dose boluses, or you can give it as a continuous infusion. Some possibly will probably go to the ICU. So that's going to have to be an institutional decision about giving IV ketamine as an adjunct to um, pain management. So we do that with care and, and uh, coverage. Well, then let's move on to what you covered so nicely at ASH in the educational session. You know, it's kind of a, you do like a duh, gee, these patients are on long-term opioids up and down levels. There must be the possibility for chronic problems or a side effects. So you talked about cognition, brain, mood, um, personality. So comment on what you found and what you said about long-term side effect. Um, when I, I went from being a pediatric hematologist and an adult medical expert, and I never recalled having a detailed discussion with my patients and their families about the side effects of chronic opioid therapy. It just wasn't a thing in the 80s and the 90s, right? And even in the early 2000s. And when I began to look at what I'm seeing in my young adults and my um, adult patients, you know, we have the physical side effects, but we also have the psychological and the behavioral side effects. So physical side effects, we know about the nausea, vomiting, and constipation. We understand withdrawal symptoms. But I never really thought about insomnia, thought about reduced libido, thought about um, joint aching from being on morphine, um, the issue of the risk of cardiac complications like ACID when you get um, opioids chronically, and of course, the risk of tolerance, where the same dose doesn't work as well, or allodynia, where little things that shouldn't cause pain, cause pain, or hyperalgesia where you have heightened response to pain from the same stimuli. And so those are the physical consequences. I mean, the dental decay became very clear as I began to see my young adults in, you know, going to college and coming out of college. Um, you know, they're in the hospital for like weeks at a time, they don't brush their teeth, and the next thing you know, the teeth start to crack and they fall out. And, and it's really embarrassing for our patients when they have no teeth when they're 30 years old. Yeah. But the psychological consequences, what struck me one day was a patient of mine who was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and her behavior was atrocious. She just was very poorly behaved, yelling at people, cussing at people, just very oppositional, you know, declining X, Y, Z care that she normally wouldn't decline, and really having not a good justification for saying, I don't want to get my Miralax, I want to get my x-ray, I don't want to get my lab done. And when she recovered from her admission, and I saw her in clinic, I said, you know, why were you behaving like that? She said, it's not the issue. I never did that. And I was like, excuse me? We never did that. And it struck me, she had no recollection about her behavior. And I've seen it over and over again, really as an adult. You know, when they come into the hospital, they do not recall yelling at you, sitting at your face. You know, when you tell them, when you go home, do X, Y, Z instructions, they don't remember their discharge. Mm -hmm. They don't remember to go pick up their prescription from the pharmacy. They don't remember to make this appointment. And I would think they're just poorly compliant patients. But when I took a step back and said, why would this patient, who is normally very well behaved, very compliant, after an admission, doesn't do anything that they were asked to do? And it really made me look into what are the complications of being on IV opioid for two years? Poor memory, paranoia, psychosis. They get more depressed, they become more anxious. They have mood swings, they're angry today, they're happy tomorrow, they're crying in the morning, they like excited in the evening, um, they get drowsy and confused. And you know, I had an unfortunate situation where a young man, you know, was leaving the hospital after admission and he ran his car into a tree and broke his L4, L5, you know, increased motor vehicle accidents, making poor decisions. Mm -hmm. Like I had a patient who threw uh, a candy um, container at her, do her doctor because she was upset. And she she was such a normal behaving young person and then after this admission she just was acting kind of like out of her mind and so we tend to blame them for their behavior and not thinking about hmm maybe being on opioids has affected their cognition in the short term and sometimes even in the long term you know i've had to put their medicines in a bubble pack so that they take their long acting the way they're supposed to and not the long acting like a short acting opioid and the short acting like a long acting because they just don't remember the instructions. And these are people who don't have any kind of stroke, with no brain MRI finding. So I can attribute that to having had some kind of CNS damage. You know, I think that's, that's awfully good information. I'm listening as you say this and thinking, 
because I'm mostly involved in the inpatient setting, I have to fight myself getting upset and angry at the patient. You're acting out, you're rude, you're not listening, you're not uh, following direction, not paying attention. Well, they're, they're on very neuroactive drugs. They're like drunk yes, and they don't realize what they're doing. And then they're perfectly nice. And in fact, I was struck the other day how, how nice and well-dressed and well-behaved one particular patient of mine was in the clinic. I didn't hardly even recognize her. Absolutely. That's really useful information. All right. Anything before we come to a close on other long-term effects of, of course, drugs and addiction, which we try and avoid, or long-term brain effects? So I think it's important that people who take care of sickle cell individuals remember that there is nothing special about sickle cell disease that makes them not at risk for all the complications of chronic opioid therapy. There, there's no genetic protective factor. Um, if they have a high opioid risk score, which is a screening test that we do to look at their risk of having an adverse opioid outcome, so family history of substance abuse, either alcohol, illegal drug or prescription medication, or a personal history of substance abuse, if they had uh, pre-adolescent sexual abuse or any kind of psychological diagnosis, ADHD, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, and depression, if they have a high score, then they are at higher risk of getting negative outcomes from opioids, either accidental or incidental overdose, aberrant behavior, misuse, overuse, and even addiction. I have very few truly addictive patients who also have sickle cell disease, but I have a lot of patients who have opioid use disorder in what I would call more of a physiological dependence, and then they have behaviors that if you don't really pay attention, you could lump them as having addiction, right? But these are uh, uh, opioid consequences. You know, they take their medicine and then they go driving and then they get an accident or, you know, they drive machinery. I mean, that's just risky behavior. It's not um, illegal behavior, but it's risky behavior to the patient. And so we have to think about what is their risk of opioid misuse or negative consequences before we put them on chronic opioids. Mm -hmm. And if they're on chronic opioids, are they responding well? So are they having a positive response in terms of good functioning, normal uh, cognition, their, their mood is stable, or are they moving into negative consequences where escalating use, different ER visits, and they're needing more and more and more opioids? In that situation, then it's not probably the right option for them. And you know, you can de-escalate, you can switch opioids, and I have actually used buprenorphine or my patients who fall into that high risk category as well as treating their pain and treating the opioid dependency that they suffer from, from being on high risk opioids for a very long time. I mean, I feel bad that patients were never educated about the long-term consequences and they become victims of treatments that we have given them. So I think it's our responsibility as doctors to understand opioids ourselves, kind of deal with our emotions about opioids and be willing to educate appropriately, be empathetic, and support our patients appropriately. So I actually got waivers to give Suboxone because I wanted to be able to treat their sickle cell disease and their opioid dependency in a compassionate mm -hmm. way because many people don't even understand opioid dependency and they don't understand sickle cell disease. So when you lump the two together, you're kind of in a significant disparity situation. So I treat my patients with Suboxone and buprenorphine if they need it. And I mean, they get their lives back. It's unbelievable. I had a patient who was on 270 milligrams of methadone. And in the ER four or five times a month. And we got her on buprenorphine and she's gone to cosmetology school, got her first apartment, bought a car, and ended up going on her first ever vacation to Myrtle Beach. And mm -hmm. when I see her, my heart just sinks. It's like a beautiful thing. And she only uses her buprenorphine once or twice a week. And I get her, I give her a prescription for a month and it lasts for two or three months. And so she's gotten her life back. She still has sickle cell disease and I treat her with her sickle cell regimen, but she was already on them and having high dose opioid use and living in the hospital. So there are options that we can use for our patient population, running from the pain literature and from the anesthesia folks and from the addiction and you know opioid dependency literature. I think that this is a team sport. We need all players involved. I think that we need to make sure we address their social determinants. So that's important. If they're stressed out and homeless, you know, giving opioids is not going to fix that. If they have depression and anxiety, treat that. If they have rheumatoid arthritis, treat that. And also treat the sickle cell disease as some sort of disease modifying selection. Well, as always, if I've learned a lot from you, a couple of take-home points in my mind is the patient who's left the hospital and 
might be acting out because they're subacute withdrawing. I hadn't thought of that. That's such a good uh, idea to keep in your head. Another one is don't just assume another vasoclusive crisis, do a timeout when they're admitted is something else causing the pain. <clears throat> and especially don't fall asleep at the switch, start the PCA Monday and come back to it Thursday. I'll, I'll keep that in my head for quite some time. So, and also the long-term effects of cognition, which you've covered at ASH and our listeners could always go to the ASH website and hear you speak at that particular setting. So I wanna thank you again, Ify, and remind everyone we've been listening to my friend and colleague, Dr. Ify Asunquo, who is director of the Sickle Cell Disease Enterprise where she's professor of medicine at the Levine Cancer Institute at the Atrium Health, and she is in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you thanks so much for joining us again today. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate it. Um, this has been a great experience. Thank you. Likewise, as always. Thanks so much. See you for number three real soon. Very soon. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Effie. Blood and Cancer is produced by MD Edge. Our editor is Jen Smith. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by executive editor Kathy Scarbeck, and I'm your host, Dr. David Henry. <laughs>